It's a privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Matthew Amons, who's a Associate Professor of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging and the Director of NIR Fellowship in Neurointerventional Radiology uh, at uh, UC San Francisco. And so he's uh, agreed to give us a little talk today on uh, uh, vascular abnormalities and pulsatile tinnitus. So uh, we look forward to your talk. So Dr. Amons, go right ahead and start, please. Thank you. Well, thanks, Bill. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, it's my honor to be speaking here today about one of my favorite topics, pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, I love it. I get pretty excited about it. So fair warning, if I start talking fast or I say something that is controversial, because a lot of this is based on experience, interrupt, we can have a conversation about these things. Uh, and I'd love that. In addition to the other things I do up here, I also have been running our UCSF Pulsatile Tennis Clinic for about a decade or so. And so this talk sort of springs forth from that. The image that's up on the screen uh, is a frontal x-ray picture of a patient that I treated with venous sinus stenting. And so you can see stent extending through the superior sagittal sinus into the tortula, out the transverse sinus, and then the sigmoid sinus. All right, so venous sinus stenting, more about that in a bit. These are my disclosures, but disclosures are kind of boring. So there's also a cool video. The cool video is the patient's brain aneurysm. Uh, and so this is her aneurysm. And what we're looking at here is the blood flow going into the aneurysm, swirling in the aneurysm and coming back out. And this is evaluated using MRI. The sequence is 40 flow. And so it's real time direct imaging of blood flow in patients' blood vessels that we're able to do now with MRI. We'll talk about how we use this for pulse tennis in a little bit. The other disclosure is that this is the work of, you know, several years with many colleagues that you can see on the screen. Uh, you guys are probably most familiar with Charles Lim and Jeffrey Sharon, our neurotologist, but we have a multidisciplinary clinic in which we see our pulse pulse tennis patients. And so a lot of what I'm gonna say is based on that experience. The take home points that I want, uh, particularly the trainees to really walk away from, uh, take away from this talk. If you hear a brewery on examine a patient, you should really consider that there's very likely to be a dangerous cause for your patient's pulse tennis, something that could lead to stroke or bleeding in the brain. These are the ones we must take very seriously. So brewery on exam, bad. Venous sinus stenosis is the number one cause of pulsatile tinnitus. All diagnoses, everything wrapped into one, number one most common cause is venous sinus stenosis. And then the third point uh, that hopefully I can illustrate today is that if we take an open mind and really dig in, we can find the diagnosis for the vast majority of these patients and actually cure a lot of them. Uh, so these are the main take home points today. All right, so that we're all talking about the same thing today, pulsatile tinnitus. Tinnitus, we all know, uh, particularly the neurotologists, is a sound without an extracorporeal source that patients appreciate. Pulsatile tinnitus is tinnitus that has a rhythmic component. And patients talk about a whoosh, a swoosh, a click, maybe walking through snow. They can become quite loquacious with their symptoms, but it's a symptom. What it is not is a continuous tone at 12 kilohertz, like this high pitched piercing, always there tone. Uh, this is not pulsatile tinnitus. And pulsatile tinnitus accounts for about 10% of the overall tinnitus population. So a huge number of patients. And it really involves this broad spectrum of frequencies. There are many underlying causes, some of which can be quite dangerous to patients. So it's important to take it seriously. So this is a recording. Hopefully that's coming through okay. Uh, I took this with one of my Bluetooth enabled recording stethoscopes that I heard the patient's pulse tennis. This is a brewing heard over their head. It's kind of annoying to talk over. Uh, it's annoying for patients, right? So one of the main problems with pulse tennis is there's this huge psychiatric impact that patients have. We looked at our first six months of data and we found that about two thirds of our patients had debilitating depression or anxiety upon depression. 
There was a 12% comorbid suicidal ideation rate. So very debilitating, worse than really any other chronic illness. This is more debilitating uh, than like terminal cancer patients are, have. We've also learned that if we can treat the underlying cause of their pulse tinnitus, we can treat the depression or anxiety that goes along with it as well. It takes a little time, but they get better. So how do we approach it? We have sort of developed our own approach. We try and lump patients into these like big groups, big categories, because their um, symptoms are similar, their physical exam findings are similar, and their imaging findings are similar within these different categories. Uh, and then depending on which category the patient falls in, it determines which of our physicians are going to then proceed with the patients. So we use the tumors and structural causes, probably the causes that you all are most familiar with, the vascular causes, and then neurogenic causes. We define neurogenic as the, the nerves are firing and telling the brain there is sound when no sound is actually generated. Some folks call this somatosensory pulse tennis. It's kind of like the same thing. And we've published about our sort of clinical approach to these patients, as well as the MRI protocol that we rely on very heavily uh, to help differentiate these patients. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Uh, the papers are there for you guys to look up if you're interested. And then, of course, depending on which differential diagnosis we think the patients fall into, uh, which we determine in our multidisciplinary clinic. The, the first day is really determined, we try and determine which of these big categories each patient falls into, and then that determines who's going to then follow up the workup, all right? So, uh, but because I'm the blood vessel guy, I thought I'd spend the rest of the time really talking about the vascular causes. And we divide the vascular causes into those that can cause stroke, uh, ischemic stroke or bleeding in the brain, uh, the causes that occur involving the arteries of the head and the neck, and my personal favorite, the abnormal connections between the arteries and veins, which is called a dural arterial venous fistula. This used to be called like a, a dural AVM or something like that, but it's just direct connections between arteries and veins. These are the real dangerous ones. And then the venous causes, which are more common but not as dangerous. Again, we can cure a lot of these though. We divide the venous causes into idiopathic intracranial hypertension because it's the only one I'm aware of that can really hurt patients uh, because this can cause blindness and then sort of all the other ones. All right, so this is the vascular breakdown that we take for our patients. And I thought I'd start with the dangerous stuff, the arterial causes and fistulas and explain this through a series of, of case vignettes. All right, so Kind of a busy slide, but let's work through it. 46-year-old woman comes into clinic. She has right-sided, pulse synchronous, pulse little tennis. She describes it as a high-pitched kind of whooshing. So we describe, we, we talk about this with our patients. We have them sing it to us. And sometimes I try and have them uh, pick between what I'm saying. And so high frequency for me is like a psh, psh, psh kind of sound as opposed to um, like a like a rumbly, deep, bassy sound. So this high pitch stuff, uh, we're starting to think about the arterial causes. The deep, bassy stuff, that's usually the venous causes because the blood vessels are bigger. They all kind of take about the same amount of blood flow in them. So bigger pipes, the flow is slower. The smaller pipes, the arteries, the flow is much faster. So it's higher frequency whooshing. Her symptoms don't get better or worse when she's lying or standing but it does get worse when we press on the same side of the neck as she has her symptoms. So right-sided pressure, right-sided symptoms, things get worse. There's no change when we press on the left. And when we really go in between the sternocleidomastoid and the trachea, feel the carotid artery and press it up against the spine, her sound goes away. So that's like a very specific physical exam maneuver does carry a risk of carotid dissection and stroke and things like that. So it's like not for the faint of heart and maybe shouldn't be done on all these patients. Uh, but in specific examples, you can do it, particularly if you have carotid imaging going in. Um, and that stopped her sound. So we think this is probably some sort of artery related problem. And she has a past medical history of hypertension. So this is the imaging that we look at. This is a frontal view. It's a contrast enhanced MRA. 
Um, the cervical segments are down here, and then the intracranial stuff is up here. And so what we look at here in the right internal carotid artery, you can see this beaded appearance. The left internal carotid artery is also involved, but she just has right-sided symptoms. Uh, this is fairly common. I think it depends on how severe the disease is and where it's located relative to the skull base as to whether or not the patients have pulsatile tinnitus from it. On angiogram, you can see the same kind of findings. This is the right internal carotid on top and the left and the bottom. So this sort of beaded appearance involving the internal carotid arteries. And this is fibromuscular dysplasia. Fibromuscular dysplasia. So what do we do for patients who have fibromuscular dysplasia involving the carotid arteries? Well, carotid artery stenting is like not a great idea. You can tear up the vessels. It's somewhat difficult and challenging to navigate. You can cause probably more harm trying to stent the carotid arteries. Um, so we don't do that. So what do we do? This, the sound is caused by high pulse pressure going across the corrugated sort of lumen, if you will, up against the skull base. So this big pulse, particularly in hypertensive patients, causing turbulence at the skull base. So you can bring down the blood pressure in these patients, and that can basically cure their pulsal tinnitus. All right, so fibromuscular dysplasia can also involve the renal arteries. In this patient, it did. And so this is a renal artery angiogram that you're looking at, and you can see the sort of beaded appearance here as well. And if we do renal artery angioplasty, it cures their hypertension, which then goes on to cure their pulsal tennis. All right, so if you see fibromuscular dysplasia causing pulsal tennis, if they have hypertension, think what's going on in the renal arteries, because that's really quite safe. It cures their hypertension, which is often very difficult to control, and also cures their pulsatile tenderness. All right, so fibromuscular dysplasia uh, is a dysplasia that can involve any of the layers of the blood vessel, typically involves the medium and large arteries. So this is like the stuff in the neck, um, not so much the aorta, the renals, yes, not really in the brain as often. There's a risk of stroke because the blood flow through the carotid arteries can be, have little eddy currents and blood flow can stagnate downstream uh, from the areas of stenosis. Platelets can aggregate there and then they go downstream and, and can cause emboli. So if they have very severe pulsatile tinnitus, which it really does have to be quite severe to cause pulsatile tinnitus. If they have severe fibromuscular dysplasia, we treat these patients with 81 milligrams of aspirin to mitigate that stroke and then think, is the renal artery, are the renal arteries involved? Because that can cure the patients. So reviewing some of the common symptoms that we kind of talked about that this patient presented with for the arterial and fistula causes, this is a, an image looking at a dural fistula. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But these patients usually present with a higher pitch whooshing sound as opposed to the low pitch rumbly sound of the venous causes. So arterial is higher pitched. They often have a brew on exam and so where do we listen? We'll talk about that in a minute, but always listen to patients' heads and neck when they have pulsatile tinnitus, because you don't want to miss this kind of stuff. We always do MR angiograms in our patients because it's the best way to find the most dangerous of the arterial causes, which is the dural arteriovenous fistula. Dural arteriovenous fistula is abnormal connections between the high pressure arteries and the low pressure veins. So this is an image of an occipital artery you can see there's all these connections that have formed to the patient's sigmoid sinus here. And then that high pressure flow goes past the ear, which is located here, and causes pulsatile tinnitus, right? The problem with this is sometimes the pressure goes back up towards the cortical veins. And if it does that, it has a very high risk of causing bleeding. So dural fistula, best seen on MRA. Uh, and all these patients talk about this higher pitch kind of whooshing sound. Their sound gets better specifically with arterial compression, which is not just neck compression. If we do neck compression, that is always venous compression because the jugular vein is not, as you all know, uh, a, a like robust structure, right? So the second we start pressing on the neck, the first thing that gets compressed is the jugular vein and that stops blood flow in the sigmoid sinus and the transverse sinus. So that's venous pulsal tennis that gets better with neck compression. Arterial pulsal tennis you got to get in there, press the occipital artery against the skull, press the carotid artery against the spine. Uh, it, it's like a different thing. 
if we're just pressing on the neck, what we end up doing is just slightly narrowing the artery. And that usually makes arterial pulse flow tinnitus worse. All right, so these are the kinds of things that we're looking for to find the dangerous causes of pulse flow tinnitus. And we always listen to the patient's head, right? So stethoscope, uh, one of my colleagues likes this other one. This is like a, a two-person stethoscope that I don't know if you can buy yet, but you can make them. And basically the patient gets a set of, of headphones and you get a set of headphones and you're listening together and they can say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. That's what I'm hearing. I find this to be kind of like intimate and weird. So I'm like not into it, but one of my partners loves using this. Uh, so I just sort of present it as an option. Where do we listen? Well, we listen along the dural venous sinuses. So most common it, uh, for the dural fistula is the sigmoid sinus dural fistula. So we're listening, you know, behind the ear. But, and, and then along the temporal region, the transtemporal window can really hear the deeper types of dural fistulas in the skull. And then we go along the superior sagittal sinus. So we start at the front, we go up to the vertex, all the way back to the occiput. And then we go out along the transverse sinuses and down. We listen over the orbits. So have the patients close their eyes, listen over the orbits. The carotid cavernous fistula is right behind the eyes. And this can cause pulsal tinnitus as well. And then we listen for carotid brewing. Uh, in my practice, atherosclerotic disease is not as common as dural fistulas, but you know, we see sort of like a skewed patient population. And then always listen over the heart. It turns out aortic stenosis can particularly cause right-sided pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, so like most commonly in elderly women, actually. And then if you hear a brewery, like over the head, really want you to be thinking this is a dural arterial venous fistula, which can be very dangerous. And those patients need to go on for a diagnostic cerebral angiogram. So, you know, call Rob Darflinger, call me, uh, and, and we'll get these patients in. If you just hear it over the neck, carotid ultrasound is okay. But if you hear a brewery anywhere else, we should be thinking diagnostic cerebral angiogram. Those are the ones that go up. All right, so let's look at another case. Four-year-old woman, she has left-sided pulse tinnitus and went away. All right, end of story, right? Are we done? If we were done, I wouldn't be talking about it. So no, she also now has headache, nausea, and dysmetria. All right, so a bunch of neurological symptoms and her pulse tinnitus is gone. So what are we dealing with here? We do an exam. We always listen. She has a brewery behind her ear. All right, so this is like a dangerous situation. The sound is gone for the patient. It's there for the doctor. Doctor, and she's got a bunch of other neurological problems. So this is an emergency kind of thing, or at least very urgent. Here's her head CT. There's diffuse swelling here. Usually we would see sulcation up here. There's no sulci. The gyri are just like smashed up against each other. Down lower, the supercellular cisterns are like all effaced. There's a little bit of um, hydrocephalus in the ventricles here. And the rest of the sulci, they're all gone. All right, so this is a very dangerous picture for the patient. Uh, lots of brain swelling here. We go on to do a CTA, uh, which is not my preferred method, but it's always available in the ER. And what you see is basically like just a whole bunch of vessels everywhere, all right? These are all big dilated cortical veins because there's a lot of pressure in the venous system. Now the brain's not draining well. That's why there's all this edema because there's all this pressure in the venous system right? And particularly in the left side here, behind the left ear, where we were listening, you see a whole bunch of vessels. So the best way to actually see this entity is on a time of flight MR angiogram. And this is what we see. So this is like a collapsed view, looking at all of the blood vessels in the head. And we're looking at the patient from the feet up. So the right side's over here, left side's here. And you can see a huge left occipital artery. There's a huge right occipital artery. And then we're seeing all this flow in the transverse sinus, not much in the sigmoid sinus really, but the transverse sinus. And this, this is a dural arterial venous fistula. All right, so abnormal connections, like I mentioned earlier, between the arteries and the veins. And this causes pulsatile tinnitus when the blood flow comes down along the sigmoid sinus, right, up against the mastoid air cells, which as you all know, are sort of like are tuned to transmit vibration into the cochlea. So patients hear a dural fistula when there's blood flow near the temporal bone. 
if this were to thrombose, like in this patient, the sound goes away. The sigmoid sinus thrombosis, but the fistula is still alive. And now the pressure in the, in the vein can no longer decompress down the jugular vein and it skyrockets. So the pressure in the sinus goes really high and it goes retrograde into all these cortical veins. The brain is no longer draining well right? Because there's all this pressure in the cortical veins. And there's a very high risk of bleeding in these patients. When we see cortical veins that are dilated like that, the annual risk of hemorrhage is about 20%, 20% risk of bleeding per year. So this is her angiographic images. And just for orientation, these are both lateral projections, the feet are at the bottom. So that's the inferior aspect. The patient's nose is off to the right. So lateral. And what we're seeing here is in the external carotid artery here, multiple branches dumping right into the dural venous sinus here, the transverse sigmoid junction. And the sigmoid sinus down here is thrombosed off, right? So the blood flow is no longer going past the ear. That's why the sound is quiet. But now it's compressing and going back into the brain. The internal carotid artery is also supplying the fistula. All right, so we can treat these. We treat these from inside of the blood vessels. If one were to sort of like, operate on these, cut into it, all these vessels start bleeding like crazy and it can, it can be massive blood loss. These are really best treated inside of the blood vessels. Uh, at major centers that treat a lot of these, it's pretty straightforward. For this patient, because the brain's no longer using the dural venous sinus, we just seal the sinus. And we did that with this liquid embolic material from the occipital artery called onyx. And so that's kind of flows in like lava and we just take out the sinus. Uh, and cures the patient. All right, so talking about, again, some of these common signs and symptoms, higher pitch component, right? The patients are talking about that fetal ultrasound, and you really have to drill down on it. Get them to make the sound. If they make this, psh, psh, confirm it. Make the sound back to them. Give them an alternative option, right? They can't always make a deeper sound, and right now I'm really excited, so I don't make the deepest sound, but like a <sighs> kind of sound. That's the veins. Fistulas and dangerous causes, usually these higher pitch sounds. Brewery on exam. This is like trigger, very dangerous. We're looking at these particularly on MRI angiography. It's much easier to see this dural fistula uh, or even the little ones on time of flight MRA than it is on a CTA. And then it gets better, particularly dural fistulas get better with occipital artery compression. You can find the occipital artery in this notch of the skull behind the ear. You can feel the pulse. You can feel one side is bigger than the other if you use two hands. And then if you press on that artery and close it, they say, oh, it's magic. It's gone. You're amazing. You're the best doctor I've ever seen, right? It's not magic. They have a dural fistula and that needs to be treated. All right. So some of the other common causes uh, of the arterial, dural, arterial uh, and high, high risk Pulse little tennis causes, shunting lesions actually number one. So dural fistula is, is more common, uh, and this has been seen in multiple other uh, practices, but again, these are like referral centers. Um, so dural fistula, in my experience, is much more common. That might not be everywhere. And then atherosclerosis is obviously a common cause. Um, has to be pretty severe. Not everybody can hear it. I think it depends on exactly where in the neck it is and the angle of the jet of blood flow through that stenosis, whether or not it's sort of is transmitting sound uh, all the way into the petrous bone. Arterial dissections can be pretty common, particularly after trauma, if patients have pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, I've also seen it after chiropractic manipulation. Obviously not all chiropractic manipulation causes dissections, um, but it can happen. And so if patients have Pulse little tennis that starts after trauma. We sort of start them on a baby aspirin right away and then sort it out. We kind of presume there's a dissection to minimize the chance the patient can have a stroke. And then fibromuscular dysplasia we talked about. All right, so we talked about some of the arterial causes and how these patients present. Let's move over to the more common, uh, the venous causes. So the number one venous cause of pulse little tinnitus is dural venous sinus stenosis. All right, this is actually all comers, pulse little tinnitus, most commonly caused by venous sinus stenosis. So where are we talking about? So this is a caricature looking at this. The, it's 
the blood vessels are blue because we always make the veins bright blue. Here we go. Superior sagittal sinus comes up and over. This is like the Mohawk vein, comes to the torcula, divides into the paired transverse sinuses that extend out laterally towards the ears and then into the sigmoid sinuses and then jugular veins as they come down. Patients most commonly develop stenosis at the lateral margins of the transverse sinuses. It can be unilateral or bilateral. If it's bilateral, that can cause idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, but venous sinus stenosis is the number one cause of pulsal tennis. So if you see a pulsal tennis patient, you press on their neck and the sound goes away, like nine times out of 10, it's venous sinus stenosis. And we can cure this all day. All right, so this is kind of a recently understood problem. Symptomatic venous sinus stenosis is what some of the, the vascular folks like myself are calling it. The reason it's only recently understood is because the MRI technique now allows us to visualize it. A decade ago, when we were doing MRIs, we sort of switched the way we acquired the sequences and the veins used to be basically like this invisible flow void. Now we can see them. And so because we can see them, we're starting to see that venous narrowing is really quite common and it can cause a bunch of symptoms. Most commonly is pulsal tinnitus. It can also cause headaches and brain fog, which I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that means. I mean, I sort of understand what it means, but I can't really measure it well because I don't know. I live in fog in San Francisco. Maybe that's a problem, but it's hard to measure brain fog. And it can cause papilledema, so swelling in the back of the eyes. This used to be called, and it still is, but uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. Whenever we see this uh, venous sinus stenosis, the first thing we're thinking is, do they have IIH? Because that can cause blindness. And obviously, IIH is the pathological elevation of the intracranial pressure that can cause vision loss, headaches, also tinnitus, right? Sound familiar? Like all other symptomatic venous sinus stenosis can cause headaches and pulsal tinnitus. We all know this often occurs in overweight women of childbearing age. And in that patient population, it's seen in 22 out of 100,000. All right. So I would argue it's no longer idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It's really symptomatic venous sinus stenosis. So how does this work? There's a positive feedback loop and nobody knows how it starts, but in general, there's some elevation in the intracranial pressure and we don't know how this starts, but it does. But this presses down on the transverse sinuses, right? Either the vein just directly narrows and compresses or the arachnoid granulations, which are responsible for reabsorbing the cerebral spinal fluid into the dural venous sinuses, they swell. Their size is directly related to the intracranial pressure. So the higher the pressure, the more they swell. And when they swell, they cause venous obstruction. So the higher the pressure, the more the veins get narrowed, which leads to venous obstruction. So there's outflow restriction of the dural venous sinuses. But they still have to do their job draining the brain, right? So all the blood flow comes up, it perfuses the brain, it still has to go outside of the head, otherwise our head will like swell forever, right? But that doesn't happen. So what happens is the pressure builds up in the upstream side. And so that causes venous hypertension. The cerebral spinal fluid is reabsorbed into the veins through the arachnoid granulations, and that requires a pressure gradient higher in the cerebral spinal fluid than in the veins. When the venous pressure goes up, the CSF, the venous pressure gradient comes down, which results in decreased CSF absorption, which then goes on to lead to more elevation, further elevation of the intracranial pressure. So this is the, the now understood pathophysiology behind pseudotumor. So how does treatment work? Well, we can treat these patients with conservative management, which is diamox and weight loss. And that probably affects how much cerebral spinal fluid is produced. Venous sinus stenting, so we can go up and open the veins. Well, that targets the transverse sinus stenosis. Optic nerve sheath fenestrations and, and, and lumboperitoneal and ventricular peritoneal shunts, they basically allow an alternative conduit for CSF absorption, right? So this is how the different treatment methods work. So how, what else do we know about transverse sinus stenosis in IIH? Well, it's, it's really critical to the pathophysiology as I just showed you. 
And we know now that there's a focal stenosis in at least 93% of IIH patients. It's probably higher. Uh, this study was done as our MRI technology was continuing to evolve. Um, I see it probably in 97%. There's other funny things that can cause um, dural venous hypertension uh, and then propagate the same pathophysiology mechanism. And then if you compare that to non-IH patients, we see uh, focal stenosis in only 6.8% of folks that are just sort of walking around. We know that if we lower the intracranial pressure, the stenosis opens. And we know that if we open the stenosis and you only need to open one side because the two transverse sinuses connect in the back of the head, you can lower the venous pressure and basically immediately lower the intracranial pressure. So how do we treat IIH patients? And, and I do this all the time when we just diagnose new transverse sinus stenosis. We start with conservative therapy because there's like no risk of intracranial bleeding if you tell somebody to lose weight. So we have them lose weight, we get them in touch with our nutritionists, we have this whole uh, pathway for patients to help them lose weight. There's new medications and things like that that can help. Low sodium diet, which basically lowers the venous reserve. So we lower the amount of blood flow that's coming back through the veins, makes it quieter, lowers the pressure. And then Diamox, right? Diamox is the only randomized control medication that the only medication that we know courtesy of a randomized controlled trial in patients who have mild vision loss and mild papilledema uh, to be effective. If it's not mild or if they fail medical management, then we move on to operative therapies, right? And the older school here would be the optic nerve sheath fenestration. So go back behind the globe, punch holes in the nerve. This carries a, a fair risk of blindness uh, in each eye, it has to be done in both eyes and there's pretty high revision surgery rates. So that led to folks starting to do ventricular peritoneal shunts and then lumbar peritoneal shunts, uh, which has been the longstanding therapy for these patients for a long time. But I think we all know that shunts fail uh, and they fail quite often and shunts themselves become kind of a chronic condition. And so about 10 years or, well, probably 12 years or so ago, we started doing venous sinus stenting uh, to treat these patients. So how good are these different options? There was a meta-analysis that looked at this last year, and this is a busy slide, uh, but don't get overwhelmed. We're going to look at it uh, together. You're not alone. So the different therapies are on the left. Stenting, 825 patients that they included for the various articles. Optic nerve sheath fenestration, 818 patients. And shunting, 600 patients. So pretty good numbers all the way around. And they, the mean follow-ups were similar, longer for the shunt. But the winner here is probably uh, the venous sinus stenting. The, there's equivalency in terms of improving papilledema. Maybe the shunting's not quite as good. The complication rates are pretty good. Subdural hemorrhage um, is usually actually pretty well tolerated, it turns out, especially if we see it. If we see it during the procedure, it's low pressure bleeding that we can control. Um, and so I've, I've seen this twice now in my patients. Uh, and we've been able to control it. And the patients have not even a headache afterwards. Um, so as long as we see it, it can be pretty well controlled. And the real winner here is the revision surgery rate is really low. It's 10%, 13% in this article. Um, and almost all of the failures, treatment failures for venous sinus stenting happen within the first year. If we get outside of a year, these patients are essentially cured. And if we compare that to shunting and optic nerve sheath fenestration, they can sort of fail at any time. Um, and obviously shunting, it's a much higher revision surgery rate. So that's, that's for papilledema. But what about the other, other uh, symptoms? So papilledema, we talked about visual fields. It actually looks like it's better uh, than any of the other operative therapies. And it's probably even better for headaches. Uh, so venous science denting is emerging as the first line operative therapy for IIH patients. But that's all well and good. But yo, Matt, this is a pulse ultanus talk. What about pulse ultanus, right? Well, venous science stenting is 95% effective in curing pulse ultanus in patients with IIH. And in my experience, it's at least as effective in treating patients with venous science stenosis as the cause of their pulse ultanus. And we all know from earlier today 
venous cyanosis is the most common cause of pulse of tinnitus. So we can cure the most common cause of pulse of tinnitus. When we see venous stenosis, we always get eye, uh, a lumbar puncture and we have a multidisciplinary clinic. So there's like smart people that can, can dilate the eyes and look in the back of the eyes and figure out the papilledema. Uh, I can't do that very well. I'm still trying. Um, I'm just not great at it, but we have a multidisciplinary team, so I can rely on my colleagues to do it. And it's really pretty easy to see on MRI with contrast now. Uh, the, the diagnostic neuroradiologists, they don't always um, know to look for it because uh, this is like an emerging thing in the literature. It's really getting talked about quite a bit at all of the, the conferences. But this is something that you guys can go back and say, hey, you know, jugular vein compression turned it off. Are we sure there's not intracranial venous sinus stenosis here? Um, did we do the right study for us to look at it? And they can go back and look again. Or you can send the patient to me and I'll, I'll check it out for you. Or just call me. We can talk about it. Sometimes venous sinus stenosis gets better with Diamox, even if it's not caused by idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And it can almost always be cured with venous sinus stenting now. All right, so here's an MRI with contrast. If you look at the patient's right transverse sinus, you see there's a narrowing there, right? It's that easy now. We can just see it on MRI. The contralateral sinus in this patient happens to be hypoplastic, um, but there's almost always a dominant sinus. This is what's causing the patient's right side of pulsable tennis, especially if it gets better with ipsilateral neck compression. It often gets worse with contralateral neck pressure. So if you close the, the left jugular vein when they have right pulsable tennis, there's no more outflow outside the, out the left outflow pathway. And so everything gets diverted out the, the symptomatic side. So it gets worse with contralateral neck compression. If you have a valve salva, it pauses because the, the jugular valves down at the, behind this, um, uh, the clavicles, they close. And then it rebounds when they breathe again because all that built up pressure and all that blood flow kind of comes rushing back out. It's worse with lying down, or if you have them like bend over and put their head down between their knees, they get pretty upset about that maneuver, but it helps to confirm it. And then they always talk about it, almost always talk about it as a lower pitch whooshing sound. And you almost never hear a brewery in these patients, but you can listen behind the ear. Sometimes in a really quiet room, it's really severe. You can hear a faint pulsing there, but you can turn it off with jugular venous compression. The patient tells you it's gone, you hear it's gone, everybody's excited, the diagnosis is made, uh, and then we move on to therapy. So venous sinus stenosis, number one cause. All right, let's look at some other venous causes. So right pulsal tennis, better with right neck compression. Turns out head turning and tilting the chin down also closes the ipsilateral jugular vein. Um, so you can have them do that. It's worse with the left side. Normal opening pressure on lumbar puncture and a normal exam. So this is a, what are we looking at here? So this is a contrast enhanced MR angiogram frontal view. And it's a time resolved sequence. So we've run it out to the venous phase. So we're looking at the veins, right? This is the right jugular vein, left jugular vein, the patient's right shoulders over here, left shoulder, right down here is the, the chest, heads up here. And the finding here is in the right sigmoid sinus. So this is a sigmoid sinus diverticulum. Sigmoid wall abnormality. David Eisenman would, would love it if we called it that. You know, he and I are friends. We have differing opinions on how to treat this, but it's there. It's real. All right, here we see it on this patient's MRI. This is sort of the pooching into the mastoid aerosols. You can sort of visualize the defect there. Um, here it is on a contrast enhanced MRI. Pretty straightforward. You can see it's extending laterally. It's It's gone almost all the way through the skull. I've seen these go into the external auditory canal. I've seen them kind of like sticking out and you can like press on them as like a boggy thing and back behind the ear, it's kind of weird, um, but it doesn't hurt patients. Here it is on uh, frontal view. This is a diagnostic cerebral angiogram, time to the venous phase. And so you can see this is the same patient I showed you. Um, that's the diverticulum sticking out laterally. If you look a little bit earlier and kind of angle the, the, the camera, you can see there's a stenosis in the transverse sinus upstream going into this. 
And here we, we've done a 3D rotational angiogram and you can really see this, the, this is the transverse sinus here. This is the stenosis. And you can sort of imagine a jet of blood flow banging into this, causing this patient's diverticulum. And because she didn't have IIH, and there's a narrow connection between the, the diverticulum and the sinus, we just treated this with coils. So we went up there and coiled it off like an aneurysm. We do some brain aneurysms all the time on a cured or pulsable terrace. All right. So, you know, I'm actually quite interested in how blood flow causes sound and how blood flow causes diseases. So we took a bunch of our patients who had sigmoid sinus diverticulum and we did blood flow visualization in these patients. So this is a sagittal image uh, from contrast enhanced MRI. And for orientation, the patient's nose is gonna be out here. That's the external auditory canal. Transverse sinus is here and there's a stenosis. This is the sigmoid sinus and that's the diverticulum. And so what we did is we, we took the, the anatomic imaging and we can measure the blood flow through the sinus with an MRI. And we made a computer model of this patient's blood flow. And so computational fluid dynamics is really just a computer simulation of the blood flow. And so what we see is a high velocity jet of blood flow going through the stenosis and banging into the, the area where the sigmoid diverticulum is, right? And it, and it swirls in the diverticulum and comes out and swirls down. So this is the computational fluid dynamics. This is a computer simulation of blood flow that we can use to look at the blood flow in patients and try and figure out what's causing their sound. We can also do what I showed you images of earlier, which is 40 flow MRI. This is in vivo acquisition in the MR scanner of the patient's blood flow. And we see the same thing, right? There's this high velocity jet of blood flow through the stenosis. And this goes right into the diverticulum. It swirls in the diverticulum, comes down. There's this eddy currents in the sigmoid sinus and comes down. So we can do computer simulations of blood flow now and direct visualizations using MRI in the arteries and in the veins to try and figure out what's causing the patient's symptoms. So let's look at a couple of cases now. Right-sided pulse synchronous, low-pitched whooshing, started insidiously and intermittently. This is pretty common for venous causes. Arterial causes are more of like the snap my fingers, two o'clock on a Tuesday it started. The venous kind of sneaks in, worse with lying down, that's venous, better with ipsilateral neck compression, that's venous, but she has headaches and vision changes. All right, so we're immediately thinking IIH in this patient. We do our fundoscopic exam. We can severe, see severe bilateral papilledema in this patient. Her opening pressure was over 60. Her visual acuity was rapidly going downhill, so this is severe idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And my favorite IAH question is, what happens when you tie your shoes? And they say, my head's gonna explode, or I go blind, or I'm never gonna do that again. And you look down and they're wearing slip-on shoes, right? So this is IAH MRI evaluation, pretty common here, the venous stenosis. This is the papilledema. So this is swelling of the optic nerve head extending into the back of the globe. This tension of the cerebral spinal fluid by the cerebral spinal fluid of the optic nerve sheet. And so this patient's going blind. So we treated her with venous sinus tenting, frontal and lateral views. We have a catheter up at the vertex in the dural venous sinus. We're injecting contrast and you can see the superior sagittal sinus coming down to the transverse sinus. And then the stenosis here. This is the angiogram and you can see there's actually a diverticulum here as well. Turns out it's common to see a diverticulum in IH patients. And because she's going blind, we treat her with venous sinus stenting. So this is the stents in the area. Stenosis is gone. Pulse level tennis is cured. Everybody's happy. A week later, her, her papilledema is already improving. So the post is on the left, pre is on the right. You can see the edema has gone down. Uh, her optic nerve is actually pretty beat up. It's quite atrophic. Um, so it's been going on for some time. So how is sound generated in venous sinus stenosis? We took a bunch of patients that we thought might have IIH and we put them in an MR scanner and we looked at the anatomy of their dural venous sinuses and we looked at the blood flow in the dural venous sinuses. 
We also asked them on a scale of one to 10, how loud is your pulse little tinnitus? And then while they were in that magnet, we did an LP under MR guidance. We measured the opening pressure. We drove down the pressure by draining a bunch of fluid and their pulse little tinnitus like went away or got a lot better. And we repeated the anatomic imaging as well as the blood flow imaging. And so same patient, sound went away. We can evaluate the anatomy and blood flow while they have symptoms and the anatomy and blood flow when they do not have symptoms and see what changed, right? So now we can directly see what caused their sound. So what we're seeing is that there's a high velocity jet of blood flow. Let me orient you to these images. This is the transverse sinus coming across, sigmoid sinus coming down, and then the jugular vein. This is the venous sinus stenosis in these patients. And, bef and before we did the lumbar puncture, when they're symptomatic, you can see this jet of blood flow, high velocity blood flow, going basically right towards the ear, so into the mastoids, to the lateral wall of the sigmoid sinus. There's the jet. After the lumbar puncture, the jet goes away. No jet, no sound. So it's this jet of high velocity blood flow through the transverse sinus stenosis that's causing these patients pulse hole tinnitus, right? So what changed other than the jet? Well, if we look at, this is a graph, the velocities on the y-axis and the, the, the location in the sinus, it's on the x-axis. And through the stenosis, you can see there's this high velocity blood flow post LP in every patient, the velocity comes down. So how does that happen? Well, if we look at the stenosis here, pre-lumbar puncture and post-lumbar puncture, the stenosis opens up, right? So stenosis opens, the blood can flow slower, sound goes away. But does that blood flow actually make sound? Well, we wanted to answer that question. So we made 3D printed models of the patient's dural venous sinus anatomy. And what you see here, we printed them in wax. We basically segmented out the transverse sinus here. And here's the stenosis. There's the diverticulum in that patient that we were just looking at. The sigmoid sinus coming down and then the jugular vein. So we take and we 3D print in wax the dural venous sinus. And we take this wax model and embed it in a plastic fixture, which you can see here. And we put some mounts for some tubing in it. And then we put these models in a water bath that's warm and the wax melts out. We're left with a hollow tube. And then we can hook this up to a flow pump and push glycerol doped water. So it's the same viscosity as blood. And we push it through in this sort of pulsatile fashion. That's the exact same blood flow that we measured in the patient. And so we made a pre-lumbar puncture model and a post-lumbar puncture model. And we hook it up to our flow pump. And you can see here my uh, stethoscope is my Bluetooth recording stethoscope. And we listen to the models pre and post lumbar puncture. So here's the pre LP. And you can hear the pulse little tinnitus. And this is post LP, just some venous hum, no pulse little tinnitus. All right, so the pulse little tinnitus goes away in the flow models as well. So we can listen to these flow models and measure the sound of pulse little tennis, the rhythmic component, pre-lumbar puncture, no pulse little tennis, post-lumbar puncture, all right? So we can also use these to directly measure which anomaly is causing sound. So because it's a model, we can like change whatever we want. In this patient, we change the transverse sinus stenosis, but the diverticulum is the same. So the diverticulum is not actually causing the sound in this patient, but it's the stenosis that's causing it. So we can use 3D printed models to actually hear pulse little tinnitus and prove the specific anatomic causes of pulse little tinnitus. So I showed you a couple of different cases here, right? Both had venous stenosis and sigmoid sinus diverticulum. So which one do we treat, right? I showed you treatment of either, of both, and it worked. Well, if the patient is IIH, Stenting cures the IAH. So the answer there is, is to do a stent. If they have any other symptoms that are like close to IAH, like they have headaches or they have um, temporary six nerve palsies or something like that, or the opening pressures 
elevated, but they don't have any other symptoms, or the opening pressure is normal, but they have a sixth nerve. Any combination that's like close to IH, we just stent it after we try diamonds. But stenting requires patients to be on aspirin and Plavix, uh, both of them for at least three months and then aspirin for a year. Can they tolerate aspirin and Plavix? If not, maybe we do the diverticulum treatment. And then if we're thinking about, it doesn't sound like IH, it's just the diverticulum that's, we can maybe get away with coiling in this patient. Will the coils stay without a stent? And if they won't, we'll try the stent alone. All right, so a couple of other venous causes, left pulse tennis, better with left head turn, left neck compression, worse with lying down, no brewery. So this is all venous. Uh, but I'm going to give you a curveball here. There's some vascular structure on otoscopy. So let's look at a few of these. I'm going to show you guys some CT scans, uh, the temporal bone that may be a little bit more familiar. So this is a coronal CT of the temporal bone. And when we look in the patient's external auditory canal, what are we seeing here? Right? There's something here. And this is actually a jugular bulb diverticulum that's gone through uh, the hypotympanum and is abutting the stapes. So that's a jugular bulb diverticulum that's come up through from below, right? What other vascular causes can do this, right? This is sort of like a classic one that's on everybody's boards. But it's actually really rare. This is the internal carotid artery that's extended uh, into the middle ear. This is the aberrant ICA. So I showed you jugular bulb diverticulum coming from below, aberrant I ICA coming from really anterior, uh, it's a persistence to pedial artery a lot of the time. So we can talk about the nuances of the anatomy another day. Uh, but here's another one. What's this thing, right? There's something in the middle ear again, right? On the coronal, we can see there's something coming down and resting on the malleolus, right? So this, this is a meningocele. So I showed you bulb diverticulum from below. Meningus seals from above and aberrant ICA. All right, so just to sort of start summarizing some of this stuff, cranial auscultation is really important. And again, if you hear a brewery, think this is probably dangerous. Resolution of pulsal tennis is not always good, especially if the patients have headaches after resolution. That's usually a dural fissure that's gone in the wrong direction. Close the vessels during exam, close the jugular veins, you can close the, the, the occipital arteries, and that can help you narrow down the different vascular causes. Low-pitched whooshing is usually venous, high-pitched whooshing is usually arterial. All right, so one more, 45-year-old with left pulse lotus, she's crushed by this, she's suicidal, but it gets better with left neck turn and left neck compression. There's no brewery, normal exam, but the MRI is totally normal, and I'm at a loss. I don't know how to help this lady, but she needs help and it's probably venous. So what do we do with these patients? Well, we do what we call the Fab Four Pulsal Tinnitus, named after my favorite band, the Beatles, All right? So we bring the patient to the angio suite and we do a full vascular evaluation. This is like the Cadillac. Uh, we do a diagnostic cerebral angiogram looking for an occult dural fistula. We do cerebral venography. And we have the patients do whatever they can do to make the sound go away while we're doing the angiogram and while we're doing the venogram and see what's different. See if we can figure out where there's not blood flowing that has allowed their sound to stop. And then we target that more aggressively. We look at it more aggressively. We do balloon test occlusions. We go up with a little balloon and we say on a scale of zero to 10, Ms. Jones, how loud is your left pulse of tennis? And then sometimes we inflate a balloon and we try and make the sound go away. And if we include a segment of the blood vessel and the sound disappears, it's probably coming from that segment, especially if when we deflate the balloon, the sound comes back. We also <laughs> do penis manometry. Um, so when we looked at our patients with this, we took 165 patients to the angio suite out of 552 consecutive pulsatile tinnitus patients in our multidisciplinary center. And we found a 75% of them had a vascular cause, all right? So here, let me just show you this last little bit of this case and then I'll, I'll step aside and let you guys have your day. So this is a lateral venogram. This patient has a catheter here in the anterior limb 
of what turns out to be a fenestrated jugular vein. All right, so the jugular vein connects at the top, connects at the bottom. There's this posterior limb of the jugular vein, and a whole bunch of flow in the condylar veins at the skull base. It's a lateral projection, okay? In, in neutral, six out of 10 pulse will obtain this. When she turns her head to the left, the sound goes away. And what you can see is the flow in that posterior limb goes away. So does that mean the sound's coming from the posterior limb? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I need more evidence than that. So what do we do? We do step three. We do the balloon occlusion test. And so when we did the balloon occlusion test in that posterior limb, the sound went away. And when we deflated the balloon, the sound came back. I don't know what's causing the sound other than it's blood flow in that vein. And she was cured with surgical ligation of the posterior limb. All right, so venous causes, number one, venous sinus stenosis. We talked about sigmoid diverticula, jugular bulb diverticula, maybe jugular stenosis. I'm not sure. We're still working on that. Increased flow in the condylar veins can cause sound. More of this is being defined all the time. <laughs> but if you hear a brewery, there's likely a dangerous vascular cause. Venous stenosis is number one. And we can do all these other cool things and try and find some of these other causes that maybe aren't as obvious uh, and cure them together. So with that, you know, thank you so much for the invitation. I love talking about Paul Solo Tennis, especially to a room as smart as this. And, and I'm happy to try and field some questions. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.